Hello, hello, Joanna Fortune. It's so nice to see you. And you too, Laura. Delighted to chat to you. It seems like a lifetime ago since I actually saw you in person. I've been lucky enough to interview you several times over the years, but this whole virtual way of working has its advantages, but um, you do miss people though, don't you? I definitely do. And I'm finding since this lockdown, this this most recent one, much harder. And I realized that about myself, that I'm an, I'm an card carrying extrovert I need other people so I'm really feeling the (laughs) impact I know I'm not alone in that as well that we're all getting it this is great but it would be better to be in person wouldn't it Uh, we're looking forward to brighter days ahead exactly Uh, well I suppose hello as well to everybody who is watching us this evening thanks so much for joining us and for tuning in I suppose Joanna we'll start maybe by giving people a little bit of insight into why we're having this discussion this evening and I suppose this chat is is thanks to Littlewoods Ireland and CyberSafe Kids because they are community partners for 2021 and from the point of view of Littlewoods they recognize that many of their customers are parents mums and dads and guardians and they also appreciate the fact that they sell a lot of technology so for them I suppose being able to facilitate a discussion like this um, it's really important um, and to impart that information that you have and the advice that you're going to give us this evening is a priority for them and of course CyberSafe Kids what a wonderful charity and I know you've done an awful lot of work with them before. Fantastic and I know not only as a professional but as a parent myself it's it's a resource that I go to all the time you know they're around since 2015 and in those really sh- a few short years CyberSafe Kids have spoken to over 27,000 primary school age children in so many schools and it's amazing so I think if you're an educator if you're a teacher parent get onto CyberSafe Kids website have a look at all the resources there like you said they're a charity but they also have a very strong education function Mm -hmm. and I think all of us not just children in schools but us adults and parents that's really the type of questions I've been getting or is how can I learn more and I'm just so grateful that there is a group like CyberSafe Kids who can who can guide us all in that way. Very much so. Um, And interesting, you're saying, how can I learn more? Because look, from my experience, and I have two boys here, they're almost eight and 10. They are so tech savvy. It's Mm -hmm. frightening, actually. Yeah, Um, it is. Me in the shade. And I think that age you've just mentioned is like peak time, isn't it? Because their play patterns really change in that middle childhood stage of eight to 12. And they move away from what we parents might understand as more traditional, creative, imaginative play. And they move more towards like football, rounders, scooters, bikes, and of course, gaming and digital mm. play. So we do see a big change at that age, but they they hit the ground running, don't they? As soon as they have those devices in their hands. Which is brilliant because we live in an age of technology. And I suppose somebody told me before that, you know, it is not something to be fearful of as a parent. This is going to open so many doors and potentially careers for these kids when they're older. But we just see the fear in the unknown a lot of the times. We're quite negative in the narrative um, Um, the conversations around tech I'm trying to change that conversation now to be a bit more positive and engaged in what they're doing and there are so many pro-social benefits and there is so much learning to be had and you know we've never had uh, communities of all kinds and you know so much diversity and so much inclusion at our fingertips and that our children can engage in conversations that we really didn't have access to before and of course you know those are the myriad of pro-social mm. benefits but it comes with that cautionary piece as you said that parents are like but what if mm. and the unknown and it's largely because it's moving at a pace that par- we as parents might struggle to keep up with but also it's how can I be sure that my child is safe online mm. in this online environment that is away from me and even if they're right in front of me they are away from me when they're in Mm. this world and I think that's something that it's really important that we shine a light on and look at how we can be interested in what interests our kids and this interests our kids. Very much so and when you're talking about our children being safe online the CyberSafe Kids annual report had some very stark statistics. I got a bit of a fright when I saw them, to be quite honest with you, Joanna. The first one that jumped out at me, 93% of 8 to 12-year-olds um, have their own smart device. And my two will be included in that, 93%. Yeah. So this isn't a small minority of kids yeah. of that age group around the country. Pretty much all of them are online. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it that kind of, for me, aligns with a lot of the questions I get from parents of this age group, again, 
again, it's that middle childhood age group, which is not about should I give my child a device? It's okay, they actually have it. And now retrospectively, what should I put in place now that they have it? Because I don't know that I thought this through. I don't know how I really envisaged how important this was going to be in their life. So yeah, this statistic, it hits you, doesn't it? That 93, because we're basically saying pretty much all kids all parents this affects well, exactly um 31 of children game with people that they don't know in real life and that is terrifying um from our experience here at home our kids have just started joining a game where where they can talk to other people only in the mm. last month or two and i think it's been fantastic for them because they've been able to engage with friends when they're not able to see them uh, in real life but you always have to go in and say, who's that? Who's that? Who are you talking yeah, to? You know, yeah. and you can't always be there asking, especially if you're working from home too. A bit scary. And they don't want you asking because then you're interrupting the game. And often with children playing online with people they don't know, they don't consider it like, you know, that classic conversation we've had with our children from the youngest years of stranger danger and don't talk to strangers. They're like, but I'm not talking to them. I'm not hanging out with them. We're playing a game. Their focus is on the game rather than the person, but it doesn't mean that they might not overhear something or somebody might have not the best of intentions on there. And thankfully that stuff is quite rare. And it's important to say that it is quite rare, mm. but at the same time, I think if you know your child is talking to people in that virtual way and people they don't know, get an extra headset and listen in because it's not just the other people. I think it's really interesting, Laura, to hear how our children change, how their narrative changes, how their tone and, you know, the language they use, how that changes when they're online and they're, you know, aroused by adrenaline and the excitement of the game and they're totally engaged. And you go, oh my goodness, who's this kid? I've never heard my child play like this before. So I think it's okay to get a headset and say, I'm just going to listen in. I promise I won't interrupt you and throw you off your game, but I just want to learn a bit more and just hear the voices that your child is hearing. And it's a genius interest. idea. I love it. <laughs> But it's so clever and so simple because then you'll just get peace of mind yeah. from appreciating that they actually it is a guy that they know from their class or it is somebody else's cousin. Yeah. And if there's any strange, as you say, it's, it's very rare. It um, we don't be scaremongering here. It's just more about being vigilant and, and being aware. Isn't it, it is. It is. And again, it's that fine line which goes right through childhood, particularly if you're on the cusp of adolescent parenting, mm -hmm. you know this well, of being interested, but not intrusive. So you don't want to be coming in and you know yourself if you're in the middle of a team. TV show and someone comes in going oh what are you watching who's that and who's this and how are they and I thought that and you just go get out of here leave me alone your child will be the same they know this world they're immersed in it so be interested but not intrusive and afterwards do the reflective piece of I'd really like if I could learn a bit more about this game so when you're not in the middle of it with these other people online can you teach me how to do it can you guide me how to do it and just gradually insert yourself into their world in an interested way and that's about engaging engagement and I think that's really important be it gaming or anything they're interested in that we should share that interest yeah. with them um, I think it's wonderful that the stats also taken from the cyber uh, kids cyber safe kids excuse me annual report are saying that the majority of teen of teachers are also dealing with online safety incidents in the classroom and I think that is a brilliant initiative because they're hearing it in school as well as home we could maybe be a bit naggy sometimes but if they're getting it and they're having a conversation with their peers that might resonate a bit more. Oh, I think that's so important on so many issues that our mm. children are hearing the same message in the same way from the important adults in their lives. And teachers are very important adults in the lives of children. Mm. And I often think we underestimate how important our teachers are. And I do think that's been a lesson for all of us, thankfully, over COVID is to see actually the loss of teachers in our children's lives was really, really impactful. So I think, you know, parents and teachers getting on the same page about mm -hmm. this. I think it's why Cyber Safe Kids work with schools and parents is a really good collaborative approach and I'd like to see more of that you know here here um couldn't agree more um I don't think that my teaching abilities have been up to scratch over the last year to be quite honest I know, with you. I know. Um, we, to teachers exactly we've had so many questions in from uh Little Woods Ireland customers and fans of Cyber, Cyber Safe Kids um and we're going to get through a few of them now but can we just address um the fact that it's been an extraordinary year first and the fact that through no fault of their own, uh, parents have had to um, facilitate perhaps more screen time than they would have liked because they may be dealing with, you know, homework for two or three other children and the oldest child might be finished or they could 
both have uh, online Zoom meetings and there is a child, you know, on a rainy day, not able to go and play in the garden. There may not be a garden um, Mm. available for them to play in. So I think that kids have had probably more screen time. And I think that we're really beating ourselves up about that. Oh, for sure. That's a universal truth. So I think we can all start by exhaling, going, this is all of us. This isn't Mm -hmm. if or maybe this is definitely. And if we were having this conversation this time last year, I think my answer would be very different, Laura, because, you know, what we were looking at in the early stages of this pandemic and lockdown was particularly children under seven years old, early childhood. Mm -hmm. They're important hub of social development is parents, is siblings, and increased time with parents actually had a myriad of pro-social benefits for them. However, eight to 12 year olds and up to and including mid-adolescents, so we're talking up to 16 year olds really, They actually have always struggled with this because their important hub of social development is anyone but parents and siblings. It's the outside world. It's their peer group. You know, it's a process of separating and experimenting with who I am and establishing whoever I am. It's other than you. And that's really important. And they've been denied access to their peer group at what is peak brain development. So we are concerned about that cohort and that group of young people. And so online world has been really important to them because it has been the only way that they've sustained those connections but you're right we've all relaxed the rules because we've had to because as parents we've had to you know parent as if we're not working work as if we're not parenting and oh by the way follow a curriculum at home as though we could also be kind of teachers in the middle of all that it's impossible so something had to give and I think in universally it's been Mm -hmm. the rules around screen time now there are creative ways that we could look at it because from a child's point of view which is often where I come at this as well is That's been you saying, here are the rules. You can only have this amount of time. Do you know what? The rules have changed. You can watch as much of that as you like and sit there and watch an entire movie. In fact, watch two of them back to back. And now we're beginning to say, okay, we might be moving back towards something Mm -hmm. that's more predictable and a return to outside world activities and contact. Maybe I should put the rules back in place. Our children are not going to high five us and go, you're dead right. Good on you with the rules. They're going to say, hang on a minute. The landscape has changed. I've adjusted Mm -hmm. to these rules. So they're not going to do that. We have to do this in a collaborative way. We have to come to them. I think as parents, it's really good to use paradox with kids and say, "I, I made a mistake. I got it wrong. I got this. This is on me. I need you now to help me make it right. Because actually, I think we've all been using our screens way too much. Me too. I'd like Mm. to use mine a lot less. Can you help me? Here's what we're going to do as a family and reestablish a new family contract around screen time. Now, look, Laura, look, that being said, I would say to everybody out there, there are creative and playful ways to offset some of the impact of prolonged screen time. And just really quickly, particularly we're we're talking quite a bit about this middle childhood age, is to make a scavenger hunt, household items, like put down kettle, toaster, table, chairs, whatever you want to put on it, give it to them on a list with a pencil and as they watch whatever it is, so that you can do your hour long work Zoom call, they tick off on the list as they see the items. So they're not just absorbed into watching. They're kind of going, oh, wait, lamp. I've got a lamp and they tick it off. And at the end, you can come in and say, so look, what did you get? What was on the list? What did you miss? And then you could switch it into a director game and say, if you were director of this movie and you got to yell cut, what would you delete? And what would you put in instead? And how would that change the ending? Or what new character would you design and introduce? Who would they be? What would their powers be? Let's draw that out. All of a sudden, you're making it a much more engagement-based activity. And you can offset some of that hyper stimulus that some of our children are impacted at by too much time online. So there are ways that we can approach this without giving ourselves really hard time. That's what I really want to get that across from the outset. And based on some of the questions coming in, that we have to be a bit kinder to ourselves at these times. Well, that is great advice. And I think many of us are preparing ourselves for a battle, as you say, when things yeah. slowly open up again and hoping that by outdoor sporting activities coming back if your child is into sport that they might notice (laughs) that they're not getting the screen time they used to get of course they're going to notice they're definitely going to notice and they love it and of course they do because Mm. it's exciting and it's really hyper stimulating and there's a lot going on Um, but it's about kind of integrating the lessons from it into their real world and making it as relational as possible that's the real impact because I think you know in these extraordinary times we're living through as we Mm. keep calling them screen time has been important about connection But it's a short term substitute. It Mm. cannot be a long term substitute for in person connection. I think once our children can get back to team sports, extracurricular activities, they will be delighted to do so. 
I think you're dead right. Uh, on that note, we'll kick off a few yeah. of our viewer questions. Um, I have the names of the people who sent in the questions, which I won't um, I won't say. Okay. But um, this is a question that came in. And I, it's funny because we got loads of the same question, but for different age groups. But this is what is the recommended length of screen time for an eight year old child per day? Can you have a yeah. category per age, Joanna, when it comes to screen I mean time? In a really general way, you can, but I, I kind of caution against this being quite prescriptive because no two eight-year-olds are the same. You know, one person's eight-year-old might be able to watch a movie, do a show and play a game and then go, okay, I'm all done with that. I'm off to do something else. Somebody else's eight-year-old might spend 45 minutes online and the idea of turning it off can send them into a meltdown. Mm. And I think that's really important that we watch language here that, you know, a child having a meltdown is quite different to a child having a tantrum. You know, a tantrum there is a degree of control over they're often developmentally appropriate and they're largely a performance there's no point in me tantruming if you're not there to witness it i need you to okay. see how you have displeased me and that's what i'm showing you a meltdown is something else a meltdown is i am sensory so overstimulated that i cannot process what's been going in here going in here and that sharp shock no matter how many times you've said 10 more minutes, you may as well say two weeks because time is such an abstract concept at this age that actually it has, I feel it's happened to me abruptly and I'm having to shift from this virtual cognitive hyperstimulation into the now moment and it's too sharp a movement, ergo I melt down. And in that situation, I have no control. I'm not doing this to be difficult. I am doing this because I'm having a difficulty making the transition. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to kind of step back in this question and say, what is the answer for my eight-year-old? Generally speaking, and again, here I say I won't be prescriptive, but now I, I have an eight-year-old. I'm writing this down. Yeah. Generally speaking, what should it be? Generally, we would say two hours a day is is enough, okay, for, for anybody aged kind of, you know, seven, eight upwards, okay? Mm -hmm. I would even include us adults in that, or we are all spending yeah. actually in reality up to seven hours You're a day right. on screens. So I think just be mindful of our own use. And again, that's general. I, I would with this question, because it did come in so many times yeah. in so many guises, the important thing here is to balance screen time with other healthy behaviors, okay? That's going to be outdoor play, that's going to be family play, that's going to be more interactive play, more imaginative play. And I know parents go, oh, but eight to 12 and imaginative play. We do see that eight to 12 year olds are not getting anything near the imaginative play they need. But the research shows that if we, parents, important adults, if we make imaginative play available and appealing, that age group will migrate towards it just as much as they do to screen-based play. Actually, what happens when play patterns change at this age is we parents tend to stop playing creatively and imaginatively with our children, eight to 12 years old, because we see, oh, they've outgrown that, they're into other things now, and we let that happen instead of keeping the imaginative piece there. And it's why I do like things like the director's game. Oh, you've read a book, you've watched a show, you're into a game. If you were the designer, what would you do differently? As soon as you're doing that, you're engaging them in imaginative play. Mm. As soon as you get them wondering, I wonder if, and I wonder what would happen. And if you were if you were president of the world, what three things would you change first and why and how and what would happen? That's imaginative play. We don't have to, sometimes we think, oh, that's all about, you know, make believe and that you can do it in a really creative way, but it is important. I would say with, okay, let's aim for two hours a day. Let's kind of say we won't hit that all the time. So instead look for an active 15 minutes for every hour of screen time. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Try to keep it that way, especially in the eight to 12. If they're younger, I want an active 15 minutes for every half hour screen time. Everything pauses in the world these days, everything. So you can say, even if it is, hi, can you come here and find me a tin of beans in the back of the press? Could you open the tin of beans and pour them into a tin and just stir them for, oh, grand, in you go and play your game again. You've had your active, interactive 15 minutes. If you can make sure that every hour they've been online is balanced with 15 active minutes, I think you're going to get more of a healthy behavior balance. That's really helpful. Sneak in that little chore. I know, uh, peel the veggies, you know, yeah. anything like that. Sweep the floor, anything. yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, this is an interesting question. Should you turn off your child's device before bedtime? And this is one that, you know, is particularly um, relevant to our house because we don't allow tech time for the most part during the day when one of us is here to, to mind them properly and not both working at the same yeah. time from home. Um, so we don't allow tech time until the evening. 
And I'm kind of thinking, am I overstimulating them right before bedtime? Yeah, I mean, definitely the advice would be no screen time an hour before bedtime. And that applies to us grown-ups, by the way, everybody, as much as the children. And certainly 30 minutes before our own bedtime. And it's interesting, Laura, you know, I was doing school talks back in the days when we could do this, you know, Mm. going into schools and talking to teenagers, you know, second, third years, so kind of 14, 15 years old. And I used to do this thing, a show of hands, who in the room, the only time their phone or digital devices turned off is when the battery dies. 100% of hands, no matter what kind of school, location, background, none of that mattered. It was 100% of hands. And then if I'd say hands up, the first thing you do when you open your eyes and the last thing you do before closing your eyes is touch your phone, 100% of hands. So we know that this is something that we say, oh, ideally no screens before bed, but it's not happening. I think we have to lead by positive example. I think we have to power off our devices collectively at home an hour before bed. But the older teenager is thinking um, just about ordinary times and hopefully they will return to the classroom next week. So they're in school all day and a lot of them would get a sizable chunk of homework to do in the evening. And then there might be helping to prepare dinner and then sitting down for a meal and then washing up afterwards. So the only actual space of time that they might have might be from from seven for an hour. So does that mean that we should be sort of rearranging the schedule throughout the afternoon? Ideally, yes. Ideally, yes. And the reason being that the screen is hyperstimulating. It's keeping, you know, in terms of even just the science of the brain and our sleep, we're not Mm. actually going through the REM cycles appropriately. We're not getting the right kind of sleep. We're not getting that deep pattern of sleep that allows us to wake rested often. And I'm sure some of us will, this will resonate. You know, you're waking and you feel a bit agitated and edgy. You Mm. feel like, gosh, I feel like I've been running and running while I've been sleeping, I'm actually quite tired as I wake. And maybe it's because we've had too much screen time ourselves. And I think it's about, you know, treating it like an experiment. And I did that. I asked the kids that I was working with in these schools, I was saying, you know, who would do a 10 day experiment for me and turn off your devices from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m.? So ideally an hour before bed and while you'd be asleep. And I only got 10% take up. And in fairness to them, the rest of them were like, oh, we just don't want to lie to you because we're not going to do that. I was like, I appreciate the honesty. (laughs) (laughs) But the 10% who did do it and did see it through, they noticed, you know, did they? More, yes. And they, they filled out a questionnaire at the end saying they felt more rested. There was less tension in their relationship with their parents. They felt that they were managing schoolwork and homework better and that they felt generally happier. And when I said who would keep it up? Nobody, because oh they also goodness. felt they'd missed so much interaction with their peers. They'd missed out on events. So we, we underestimate how much of connectivity and I mean connectivity, not through a Wi-Fi, but actually relational connectivity mm. is happening on phones. What we want is that it is not the only way that our kids are connecting with their friends. I think. And again, COVID is a caveat here, yeah. but ideally that we would facilitate your friends are always welcome here. You can spend time together in our home as a family. We're going to sit and talk. We're going to play and be playful together. We're just going to check in with each other, you know, try to insert having your hot shower, your warm bath before bed, because at least that means there's 20 minutes mm-hmm. before bed that isn't on a screen. I think trying to make small changes here could make big differences. Could make a huge difference. Um, lots of questions in, and um, you mentioned yeah. this earlier on at what age should a child be before getting them a smartphone and another question that came in a lot is my my child says everyone in their class has TikTok or everyone in their class is playing Fortnite what should I do so are we bowing to peer pressure um you know and trying to keep them included with their peers I Um, think we are what what, what should we do tell us Pester pester power exists because it works like it's so effective and children are masters at the art of pester power. They wrote the book on it, not us parents. We're we're (laughs) playing catch up here. So they know, oh, but please, oh, but please. But if I and then I and know better than some child eight to 12 to do the fairness because they have a pronounced sense of justice and fairness developmentally at that age. So like, you know, yourself, like no better than a nine year old to remind you two weeks ago on a rainy Tuesday morning, you told my sibling they could do exactly what you're telling me I can't do you don't know what you did yesterday so they've got you on the back foot pester power my friends can everyone can I'm the only one who isn't it's really important that we acknowledge and empathize we accept and empathize go it must be really hard for you to feel like all your friends have something that you don't have you know part of my job of being a parent is sometimes that I'm going to do things you feel that are unfair but I believe are the right thing for you and in our family this is how we do it And I I accept that you're cross and I'm really sad that that's the way it's affecting you. 
However, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it doesn't change what's going to happen. So you can approach it in that way. I think as well, you know, when it comes to pester power, link in with the the parents of the pals and just see if you guys can come up with ahead of time, ideally, look, where are we all at on this? Are we all allowing it? Mm -hmm. Are we not? What are we saying here? And then ultimately you are responsible for your own child. So even if other families or parents are permitting it, if you are not comfortable with your child, having their own social media account or being on these Mm. platforms, then you know the answer. Trust your parental instinct. Look, we know 93%, as CyberSafe kids are telling us, you know that 93% of eight to 12 year olds already own these devices, okay? Mm. So we know the majority, the pester power is true. All my friends have it is actually a true statement. So instead you're looking at, okay, what are the boundaries about this? And so many questions come in with this. I think it is about boundaries. It's about saying you can spend X amount of time on this platform so long as I am one of your friends or Mm -hmm. followers or whatever language you're using. I have to be on that too. I will be checking in. And if I see anything that doesn't feel comfortable, I'm going to come to you and discuss it with you. But while we're discussing it, you'll be off that platform. Okay, Mm. make a digital contract set of, you know, and again, rules is not a great word because rules are rigid and they kind of feel like "Mm, I see your rule and I test you. Okay, but if you put it in terms of a structure and positive language in this family, we are whatever online. We only talk to people we know. We only accept requests from people we know in the real world that you positively reframe the language and tell me what you want me to do instead of what you don't want me to do. That's a much more positive outcome. So I would go at at it that way. There's a brilliant question in, which I think will be very relevant to a lot of uh, parents out there with teenagers. Uh, Due to my 15 year old doing school lessons online, how much more time Mm. should we allow her on her screen each day and that as you say is due to the extraordinary year but i get it and especially for teenagers who are engaging in hour after hour of zoom lesson and they are looking at a screen yeah they are and then their downtime is also looking at a screen and it's not their fault because they haven't been allowed into the classroom and so they have to be allowed i suppose a little bit Um, and would that 15 minute break come into play here as well I would say, yes, it does. But, you know, I really empathize with this. I hear this from teens so much because even during this pandemic time, my own psychotherapy with teens has been online. So I'm part of their screen time, too. Mm -hmm. And that's been something that we've had to really grapple with as well about, you know, what does that mean? I don't think we can confuse time spent, be it with telehealth therapy, be it with schooling, with actually their playtime if you like online they still need some time but I think you've got to balance it out because I mean I don't know about you Laura but I'm doing so much work online that Mm -hmm. there are times I get to six o'clock in the evening and I have a different level of exhaustion I feel like I have run a marathon when I absolutely haven't left the chair in my office the steps are embarrassing oh my god so bad (laughs) and yet I feel physically and also emotionally drained because it's a different type of stimulus it's a different type of energy that I'm expending that's also true of our kids so I would be saying that yes they should be allowed time with their friends teenagers have had an extraordinarily difficult time in this pandemic they have been you know spoken about badly in the media they have unfairly if I'm honest they have done so well to manage you know when this is so counter to everything that they need developmentally I think we have to give them a break and if you know laughing with their friends playing games with their friends if that's what they're doing online we need to do that they are going to be fingers crossed and everything else getting back to school you know and back to their peer group what we anticipate seeing is you know a big improvement quite suddenly with that reconnection in person with friends and teachers but what we don't want is a rapid return to academic pressure because that's going to then cause a surge in anxiety again so I think we have to be flexible and adaptable stay away from rules that are rigid embrace structure because structure is flexible structure is adaptable and say look you do need time you know just hanging out with your friends online I'm a bit worried about all the screen time we have in general how about when you come off school there's a 30 minute break where we come down chat eat then you can have X amount of time. And then actually we'll agree that there's going to be a 15 minute pause break every so often, because I just want to mind you and make sure that this is a, this is good for you and that you're healthy with it. That's so again, I'm not being punitive, but I'm just saying, look, I just want to make sure this is okay. And look, if it is okay, 
go for it. Yeah. But I'm telling parents, let their teens talk to each other online. It's all they have at the moment. And actually speaking of, of that and engaging with other people online, somebody um, messaged in, which I think is a really good question. My child enjoys making videos for YouTube. Am I a bad parent for letting them do this? And of course, the explosion of TikTok. And I think uh, in relation to those CyberSafe Kids survey, I think TikTok was one of the most popular uh, social media apps. Yeah, it is the most is. popular. Yes, it is. Yeah. So and between YouTube videos and TikTok, I mean, for me, because my kids, you know, sort of enjoyed that last summer and I felt that they were really engaging with one another. It wasn't as much about the screen. It was yeah. their two brothers having fun together and acting out things or showing, you know, their, their new trampoline off or whatever it might have been making their little videos. And they never families went were making else. videos together. Parents yeah. and children were doing dances and learning. And there was some lovely stuff with that. Yeah. And I think that's the side of, you know, making content can be so much fun. And then you could share that with family members on the family WhatsApp group or whatever it is, or with granny and granddad. And, you know, everybody can just get involved and play. And I, you know, I, I think that that's something that's really nice. My my own little one who's really little only turning four she was trying to learn how to floss you know so it was like chaos and not doing it, it online doing it in the garden but then she said to me do you think that grannies and granddads can do that and I was like I love that she even doubted do you think this is just what kids can do and she was trying to teach us so I think there can be a lovely interactive aspect to it mm. what you want to watch with the TikTok stuff and the YouTube is not what your child is putting up there because you can have a direct hand in that it can be creative it can be collaborative it's actually who they interact once it is up there. It's okay. other people's content. Once they're on TikTok, who else are they following and seeing? Who are they emulating? Who's influencing them? You know, we really need to be our children's greatest influencer, you know, as parents. Mm -hmm. And I think on YouTube, watch the comments. If we can disable comments, I would because I think you just invite a level of people are very cruel and unfiltered online and again I am talking about adults as much as children here um, you know there's adults could learn from this too but I think if you are doing it make sure the account is private and you know the question is am I a bad parent oh you know this isn't about being a good or a bad parent this is about trying to parent in a digital age where we're constantly feeling the internet moves at a pace that we can't keep up with so it is okay to try something out and say to your child look I'm saying yes right now and let's see how it goes but part of us as a family being online is that we review every month we sit down and go look how has that been is it as much fun now as it was a month ago is this something that we need to change how we're doing it that just because you've said yes at the beginning doesn't mean you can't go hey I got that wrong actually that didn't work out the way I think it would I, I've been watching you and you don't seem to be having as much fun so we're allowed to change our mind and take exactly, control exactly okay. exactly that and we're also modeling for our kids that they can change their mind and say look this isn't good for me this isn't so I would be trying to block the comments, I would be making the account private. And I would be you know that you have to approve followers before they're on the accounts. I would be doing a lot of that. But I think if your child is into TikTok, what they're really into, it's not that they're into TikTok, they're into what TikTok enables, which is the dances, mm -hmm. the skills, you know, being part of something bigger than themselves. And I think we can be part of that as their parents as well. Finally, Joanna, before we finish up uh, for the evening, what kind of general advice would you give to parents out there? Some of whom have really managed very well with parenting in a digital age and others um, like myself who are just sort of entering it now and you know facing up to a lot of struggles along the way. What uh, advice? Should we give ourselves a bit of a break? <laughs> what advice oh, do you have? <laughs> absolutely. Start with the break, end with the break, give ourselves a break. You know, this has been a really, if, and even taking COVID out of it, actually parenting in a digital age is difficult because as soon as we feel I totally I've nailed TikTok I get it there's something else and as soon as you've nailed the something else there's yet another thing and as our children get older developmentally when they hit adolescence and don't forget the terrible twos and threes quickly become the even worse 12s and 13s in terms of them needing and craving privacy and needing and craving that estrangement and separation from us mm -hmm. so if they're too willing to let us onto their accounts be cute not suspicious be curious might there be a second set of accounts out there that we don't know about, okay? Because they do need that privacy. So when I'm telling you to be part of your children's life online, I don't mean that you're going to be there like, you know, some kind of, you know, drill sergeant, give me your phone, I'm mm -hmm. checking up on you. This is about being playful and being, you know, kind of, okay, let's do it together. Let's discover this together. Before you give your device, any device to your child, 93% of us are doing it. Before we do that, Go and get yourself informed. It is no longer acceptable to say, 
I don't get technology. I'm not really into it. It's beyond me. We have a responsibility now. When I say be interested, I'm also saying be informed. Learn about the device. Go to a techie shop where somebody way more skilled than us will be only delighted to talk you through. Look it up yourself on YouTube, the device, and get somebody to say, here's what this device can do. And then say, am I happy for my child to have a device that has that capacity? Or am I happier for them to have something else? And mm -hmm. what might the something else be? But I also think let's just be playful and creative with it. Make sure it's not the only thing that our children are doing for their play. Make sure that we are playing with them. Even 15 minutes a day makes a difference because it's predictable. I can rely on that connection with you. And that also can be any kind of game. You can go on and learn clapping rhythm games, you know, cup of sevens, all of that stuff, because those are rhythm and synchrony. These are games that we know work with this age group and that are really effective but just be kind to ourselves. I really do. But I think that also starts, Laura, with giving ourselves a break from online because we are, us adults as well, living our lives online work-wise as well. So make sure that we're taking time out and that we're doing something in the real world for us too because then we're modeling good behavior and leading by example. I love that. You are such a calming voice of reason always, Joanna. And it's been a real pleasure speaking to you this evening. And thank you so much for all those tips. They're just brilliant. I've got them all written down here. <laughs> no, I'm delighted. And I just, you know, was struck by the, the amount of questions, but actually how many of them overlapped. And just, you know, everybody just to reassure you that we're all going through this at the same pace and we're all experiencing maybe different levels, but the same kind of things. There's a so comfort in that. Isn't we're there? in this together, you know, to use that phrase in a different <laughs> way, but we actually are. So talking to, to your your parent peers about this is also a really nice way to do it. So I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to answer the questions. Joanna, I've half scribbled your answers down here, but I'm definitely going to watch this back. Um, thank you so much for all of that wonderful advice. And to our viewers uh, who tuned in this evening, thanks for joining us as well. Uh, parenting in a digital age um, ain't easy, but as Joanna said, that we need to be kind to ourselves and give ourselves a break. We're not doing a bad job. <laughs> Isn't that right, Joanna? Good enough is good enough, guys. <laughs> exactly.